Hi, everyone. Eric Prince of Marion West. Today, I'm joined by the writer Matt Johnston, who has in the past uh, contributed several essays at Marion West, as well as uh, at a number of other publications. And we're here today to talk about his new book, How Hitchens Can Save the Left, a tribute of sorts uh, to the late Christopher Hitchens. So, Matt, can you start by telling me a bit about uh, the genesis of this book, how and when you decided to write it, and sort of the process from which it resulted. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I'm glad to see that you actually have a, a hard copy of the book. Um, I think the audiobook might be per performing a little bit better, so it's nice to see it in the flesh. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been interested in Hitchens for a very long time, um, ever since I was a freshman in college. And I was initially attracted to his atheism and just his sort of fiery presence on the debate stage and in the studio. But I uh, quickly found myself drawn to his politics, which were quite heterodox. I mean, I I certainly hadn't heard anybody uh, defending the Iraq war from a left wing point of view. And I, I found it surprisingly compelling. So, you know, I've just I've just followed him ever since. And I've always thought he was sort of a good way into politics, especially for a, a young writer. Um, somebody who's interested in being in the public sphere, just because I, I do think that he has this core set of liberal principles, which have manifested themselves in his in his work for a long time. And he's also just such a such a fascinating, articulate uh, champion of those principles. So, you know, I, I, I decided to write the book about the left just because that's his tradition. And uh, it, it certainly isn't a broadside against the left. Um, I, I'd consider myself on the left, although I suppose that that has less less meaning today than than it may have a few years ago, because I think all of our um, political labels are getting a little askew. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of the, the core summary of, of how I how I came at it. Can you say more about this idea, which you just described that Hitchens in a way is an introduction or jumping off point to getting interested in politics? Yeah, I mean, I th I think he's, you know, one of one of his quotes that stuck out at me uh, when I was younger was the idea that you shouldn't be a party liner as a, as a writer. You should try to approach every issue independently, and you should try to think as independently as you can. And Hitchens always sort of relished talking shit on his own side. And you know, there, there's this famous clip of him flipping off uh, Bill Maher's audience, and you know, he he'd say things like, "My own opinion is enough for me." If you don't like it, you can kiss my ass, that sort of thing. And I think, you know, when you're when you're younger and you're you know, kind of looking at the dreary procession of op-ed columnists and, and all the usual outlets, it, it he was he was just this kind of like splash of color and he's just this really interesting and, and eloquent uh guy. So yeah, I think for, for encountering him when I was young was was certainly a sort of boon to my career in that regard. Like it was he was exciting. And I just I I, you know, there really hasn't been anybody like him um since he passed from the scene uh, so yeah it's it, and this is why there are these long compilations of hitch slaps on youtube and it's it's why most of the tributes to him um focus on his his rhetorical prowess and, and just his brilliance uh, on the debate stage and I, I sometimes worry that a sort of hunter s thompson effect has taken hold where uh you know it's the personality um, over the ideas that, that takes precedence. And I, I see that in a lot of tributes to Hitchens, a lot of essays about him. And I sort of wanted to um, go back to the ideas themselves and the principles and see how his politics evolved over time. So I, I really tried to make the book as substantial as possible. Um, but yeah, the, it was that it was that initial just magnetic force of his personality that drew me to him. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's he's so popular today. So there were sort of all these overly buttoned up milk toast type commentators when you're young that you're seeing kind of being uh paraded out on the television and then here comes Christopher Hitchens with his one liners and his kind of takedowns and you say this is a guy I can relate to this is a guy I want to listen to yeah i mean and it wasn't necessarily that i could relate to him because he was his experience was was very far removed from mine coming from a very radical left wing tradition going to oxford um growing up in in the uk and then coming to america because you're from the heartland so. right matt i am yeah I'm, I'm from kansas right so uh this is quite different from uh from oxford <laughs> uh but yeah it was but that's the thing about hitchens is he, despite his despite his uh eloquence and despite the fact that he is seen as this bohemian uh sort of 
hyper intellectual, hyper erudite figure. You know, he also had this pugnacity that anybody can can appreciate. I mean, Hitchens would go on conservative talk radio and he would do just fine. I mean, he'd go on the debate stage with with, you know, conservative Christians in the Bible Belt and he'd, he'd do just fine because he, he, he will he'll kind of throw in um, the occasional ver- vulgar vulgarism and he'll he'll like, you know, he's just he's just more fun than a lot of other people who who I was at least encountering at that point. I, mean, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like he's just the, the only interesting writer, the only interesting rhetorician. Of course, there are many people who who I've encountered since Hitchens and, and who've influenced me heavily. But, you know, at the time, he was sort of the, the brightest uh, star in my galaxy. Let's talk a little bit about Hitchens and uh, foreign policy. So obviously, Matt, uh, I know you and I have discussed uh, foreign policy in the past when I had my show at Colin. Uh, you've written about it uh, at MW and other places uh, on a number of angles. but uh, And it's very sort of uh, in line with a discussion I recently hosted um, with an Iraqi-born um, nonprofit executive who was also kind of making the case for American involvement in the war in Iraq. And obviously, nowadays, in almost any quarters, that's sort of uh, an argument you don't hear uh, being made very much, especially uh, sort of the rise of the the NatCon movement, so to speak, and its influence on the Republican Party. So can you perhaps talk about uh, what aspect of Hitchens' defenses of uh, American intervention in the Middle East you found most uh, compelling or resonated with you? Um, well, first of all, you know, I think you do have to go back to the 90s and his support for intervention in Bosnia to really understand uh, how he ended up where he did. Um, Hitchens was a very forceful critic of, of the Clinton administration's initial right. reluctance to become involved in Bosnia. And, and he was pushing for a NATO intervention to stop Milosevic very early on. And he he made that argument with every bit as much verve and, and fury as he would later make the arguments in favor of Afghanistan and Iraq. So what I actually think is that Hitchens recognized that something had something fundamental had changed. Um, with regard to the West's role in the world after the end of the Cold War. War. Um, you, you know, Hitchens was one of the most ferocious critics of U.S. foreign policy uh, during the Cold War. Um, he wrote a book about how Henry Kissinger should be prosecuted for war crimes and, you know, all of his columns in The Nation and, and Harper's and many other places were extremely critical of U.S. foreign policy. But I think um, he recognized that when the U.S. finally did get involved in Bosnia, it wasn't for the typical rapacious imperial reasons. It was actually um, a war that could could be argued for as as a defense of human rights, basic universal human rights. And I think he just took that principle and he applied it to Afghanistan and Iraq as well. And he would later apply it to Libya. And then he was making intimations about how he thought the United States should be involved in Syria um, before he died. So um, it. It is it is ba- that basic principle that drove his uh, support for if you wanted to say as a blanket um, statement, his support for U.S. foreign policy after the Cold War. Um, but it, it's interesting to me that his his position on Afghanistan, his position after September 11th is always viewed as the crux moment, the pivotal um, shift for him. But that's really not the case. I mean, it, it really was Bosnia. Well, I think that's a really crucial point, Matt, because I think it's very common among so many critics of American pol- foreign policy to lump together or to paint with a broad brush all uh, American um, interventions abroad. And it's very typical, I think, to say uh, because the U.S. did X, Y, or Z in Latin America, uh, any future intervention is coming from uh, a similar motive or uh, is being... Uh, is looking to be exploitative, but I think uh, what he's obviously trying to do is say that not all interventions in all times are made equal and that motives can change, the role of a country can change, and perhaps it's inaccurate to say because the United States did X, Y, or Z in Central America decades before, that's necessarily the same motivation to go into uh, or be involved in another nation decades later. Yeah, and actually, he wrote this essay for Boston Review in 1993, laying out his reasons for supporting the intervention in Bosnia, and also pointing out all the times um, when he's actually had a sort of interventionist impulse in in the past. Um, he he believed that um, the Western powers should have brokered 
a deal in, in Turkey over Cyprus with Turkey over Cyprus earlier on. He he talked about having um, this sort of ironic uh, position on Rhodesia um, when when there was a rebellion against the crown. He thought that they should actually send in the troops and put it down. So um, he 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 thought it was uh, rank hypocrisy that the the Brits didn't sort of. Um, go after go after their own with the same ferocity that they would have gone after other rogue powers within the empire. So he he'd been making he'd had these, and then there was the Falklands, um, where, where Hitchens actually thought that the, you know Thatcher was justified in reclaiming the Falkland Islands from Galtieri. And it's funny in, in Richard Seymour's book on Hitch, which is sort of this um, it's it's kind of a anti Hitchens polemic in the style of Hitchens. It's like as if Hitchens was doing Hitchens, you know. Um, he he says that w- what was really at work in Hitchens' position on the Balkans was his uh, desire to see the British Empire restored. Um, but then he, he proceeds to vindicate Hitchens' position. Um, he says that, you know, that intervention led to the fall of Galtieri and it, and it was it was, you know, essentially everything that Hitchens said it was. And but then he just goes back to the narrative and he just says yet again, no, this is just an example of his imperialism at work. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think this tension was on his mind for longer than his his readers and fans may have understood. And I think it was an expression of his universalist impulses. You know, I mean, to the extent that Western powers um, had had the capacity to uh, protect human rights uh, abroad, then he believed they should do it. So I'm glad you talked about sort of this universalist uh, impulse. And I think this is a good opportunity to talk about. Uh, Hitchens and globalization, which you obviously discuss in the book. Um, so you bring up a, a 2002 interview that um, Hitchens gave, and I'll, I'll quote from the interview, quote, whether you call it globalization or not, the world has increasingly become one economy. We all live in the same economy. Does that may- mean we all live in the same society? Shouldn't it mean that? No, oddly enough, it doesn't quite mean that. Some of us have different kinds of societies within this, which are better off than the others and have more claim on human rights and justice. We're always being told of the benefits of globalization one way. We should be allowed to claim on our own behalf and that of others, the counterpart. That's therefore what politics is to me. Yeah, I thought that declarative statement at the end of of that passage was was interesting. That's what politics is to me. Um, It's a pretty sweeping claim. And, you know, Hitchens was actually, he kind of took a heterodox line on globalization, generally speaking. Um, it's, it's, it is this dirty word, uh, among many factions of the left. I mean, you'll, you'll often hear, uh, the Bernie Sanders is of the world talking about globalization Absolutely, all it's, the time. It's just this. Yeah. It, it's, it's basically just like this massive neoliberal machine that uses human beings as, as raw material. And, you know, it's, it's all about enriching oligarchs and, and companies at the expense of workers. But Hitchens always thought oh, that globalization it sounds like I'm talking have... to one of the Bernie, Bernie bros with, uh, the, the, <laughs> The jargon I'm hearing from you. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that is the position that that uh, Hitchens encountered often, and he he said that he thought something was sort of inherently progressive about the idea of globalization, and he I, he he thought that um, there should be a similar globalized version of of law and and practice when it came to international relations. I mean, that's why his book about Kissinger is called The Trial of Henry Kissinger because he thought that. Kissinger should be in the dock. I mean, he thought he should be prosecuted for war crimes. Uh, Hitchens was a believer in, at, at the very least, the concept behind the international tribunals in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Court. Um, I think he recognized later in life that many of these institutions just don't have the teeth that, ne- that they need, right. which is why he became a much more fervent supporter of the United States acting unilaterally. But that opened up many cans of worms and it in many ways set back the project. I think he was, he, he worked so hard to um, support in the nineties. I mean, you know, the Iraq war, you could easily argue that to the extent that interventionism was being accepted as, as a general principle or the responsibility to protect was being accepted throughout the nineties, that the Iraq war really set that project back um, because it led to a split within NATO uh, it made the United States look as if it it didn't care about multilateralism. Um, and and I, I think those are costs that Hitchens probably didn't, he certainly didn't explicitly seem to appreciate them, but I, I don't even think he implicitly took them on board as he probably should have, because, you know, there are always going to be compromises if you're trying to construct an, a coherent system of interla- international laws and norms. 
And that's a project that's in such early stages of its infancy that it's kind of easy to mock and deride it. You know, and I'm, I'm afraid Hitchens kind of ran to American unilateralism as an alternative too quickly. That he would have been sympathetic to that famous exchange, you've probably seen it, of that group of protesters in the back room of the Senate committee hearing chaired by John McCain chanting arrest Henry Kissinger for war crimes. Yeah, I mean, he, he would have been. Yeah, he was. Um, I mean, it's, it's something that people struggle to take on board with Hitchens and they see they see it as some kind of contradiction. Um, I'm not just taking Hitchens's view of, of Kissinger wholesale. You know, I'm not going to take to the streets and hold up the placard and say, arrest Kissinger. Um, but it, it is the, the one really massive glaring problem with the United States um, efforts to be this sort of moral tutor around the world and to construct these institutions that we want people to sign on to is the fact that we, do, we don't seem to apply these standards to ourselves uh, as, as often as we should. And, you know, the, there was during the Bush years, um, the, the Congress actually did pass something that was colloquially re referred to as the Hague Invasion Act, which basically asserted the right of the United States to go in and, and get somebody out. If, if an American official was being held in an international judicial body, we were just like, oh, we won't we won't accept that. We're going we're going to prosecute our own. Um, and we're going to take matters of justice into our own hands. And, you know, I, I understand that politically it's it's probably infeasible to imagine that something like the the international like international structure of legal norms that Hitchens was calling for um, could come to pass, uh, you know, in the next few decades. But I do think it's something worth working toward. And I do think it has some ex some successes to its credit. Um, and I actually think that, you know, the intervention that, that shaped Hitchens so um so fundamentally, the, the one in Bosnia was a pretty good example of, of the world holding a, a genocidal tyrant to account. Um, and, you know, I, if the United States had gotten involved in, in Rwanda or if the UN had actually, the Security Council had actually been roused to take action in Rwanda, I, I would think that would be a good thing as well. But if we're going to call for the consistent application of international law, then we do have to hold ourselves accountable. So that general principle is just something that we should pay attention to. Um, you know, each individual case, Kissinger, whoever, notwithstanding. So I think Libya has to be a very interesting test case of this whole situation. And as you and maybe other people know, I've um, hosted a couple of similar discussions uh, on Libya, including with uh, Jason Pack, for instance, who uh, wrote a very comprehensive book uh, on Libya in the past couple of years. And I guess one sort of looks at some of the uh, consequences, unintended or otherwise, that have sort of emanated from the uh, NATO-led intervention of Libya and sort of the fallout, where now we have even different European powers supporting uh, different factions within this rather fractured nation. And I wonder how one sort of adjudicates uh, sort of that initial impulse of, okay, we've got someone in here doing X, Y, and Z. And then on the other hand, sort of all of the uh, effects that can come out of sort of opening that Pandora's box of introducing that degree of instability in a given nation. Well, I, I think the thing people insist on misremembering about Libya is the fact that a civil war was already underway uh, when NATO got involved. Um, it's it's easy to claim that everything NATO touches turns to dust and that the United States broke Iraq and it broke Libya and it broke um, Afghanistan, and people can just run down this list of countries. It's, it's the point you made earlier where you said people just treat all these interventions as wholly uh, interchangeable with one another. Um, Libya is a case where I just think the historical amnesia is actually pretty mind-blowing. I mean, if anything, it was the, the premature withdrawal of the Western powers that led to the nightmare state that we see in Libya today. I mean, Obama actually said the, the greatest mistake he ever made as president was was uh, pulling out of Libya too soon. And Obama was desperate to get out of Libya. I mean, he was telling advisors that he wanted, I think he said at one point he wanted the intervention to take weeks, not months, something along those lines. Um, Hillary Clinton was pushing him hard to, to stay in Libya and sort of stay the course. But yeah, it's just this, it's just this reflexive um, idea that anytime the West gets involved, um, the West invariably makes the situation worse. You know, I remember watching this this brief video that um, 
Mehdi Hassan did for The Intercept, I believe, and it was just entitled Blowback, and it was about all the horrors in Libya today, which can entirely be pinned on the Western intervention. It's as if the, the civil war that was already underway uh, before we got involved just, just never happened. You know, and who's to, who's to say that that war wouldn't have been bloodier had uh, NATO not gotten involved? I mean, it just seems like this, it's a counterfactual that we can't know the answer to, but there's right. there's one assumption, and that assumption is constantly made and never questioned among people who kind of regard themselves as anti-imperialist or, or what have you. And I've, I've heard like uh, Robert Wright say that, you know, the instability in, in Syria is largely to blame um, on the United States. But that's that's crazy. We, we're, we're not heavily involved in Syria. I mean, I know we were involved, but that it was a, it was a civil war that was spiraling out of control anyway. So, you know, you know, an argument can be made. We exacerbated it. But one thing, it's a it's a funny little thought experiment that I've, I've put to people over the years. Um, if the United States had gotten heavily involved in Syria and, and put ground troops in the country and, and kind of done a, a Syrian version of Iraq, and then you had the exact same consequences you have today, uh, there's no doubt that we'd be blamed for every last bit of it. You know, and people would say, had we not done what we did, the situation would have been much better. But the situation in Syria with with a lighter American footprint is a complete nightmare. It's a nightmare. And now Assad's in power for, you know, indefinitely. So I don't know. Well, there's a sort of an interesting, and I don't need to tell you, sort of an interesting um, dynamic that's often conjured by uh, the sort of inveterate critics of American foreign policy, which is, A, it's, as you know, very uh, United States-centric, that the United States is sort of the the boogeyman that imposes itself on the um, purely sort of receiving world, and um all sorts of troubles anywhere are sort of the result of the United States. Um, so there's certainly uh, that is sort of a mainstay of a lot of this worldview. Uh, but to your point of counterfactuals, and I'm so glad you use that word because that's the word I was going to use. Um, my guest um, who came to speak to me about uh, sort of defending the American interventions in Iraq. And, um, you know, obviously I'm just, I'm here to host the discussion. I'm here to have, um, you know, let the ideas kind of, flow freely rather than to in in sort of my position uh impose a certain a viewpoint but i you know brought up to him sort of toward the end that sort of we have, what does one say about the rather large death toll that took place there and his argument was something to the effect of who's to say that wouldn't have happened regardless you know this is a country and a, and a place that is very accustomed to instability and conflict and war and death and i think it's um, maybe overly simplistic to argue that had the United States not gotten involved, that everything basically would have been honky dory and there would be, you know, no family members lost and 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 no death. And uh, obviously, this is uh, a place that, um, you know, if and when Saddam had died, you know, how are we going to figure out necessarily who his successor is? And that sort of in a lot of these countries at that time, violence was, in many respects, unfortunately, the norm. Yeah, I mean, there's. Have you have you ever read uh, the Republic of Fear? I haven't. It was, it's, yeah, Kanan Makia's book. It's 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 kind of an extraordinary account of um, how are, the Iraqi state functioned, um, certainly before the intervention, and then in his uh, in, introduction to his updated version of the book, he was talking about the circumstances in Iraq um, throughout the '90s. And it's one of the most harrowing documents you can imagine reading. I mean, inflation rates that were so staggering that, you know, you had engineers essentially subsisting on $10 uh, a month. Um, the, the Iraqi dinar was like practically worthless. I mean, it was it was this state of all pervasive government control with absolutely no prospect of overthrowing Saddam Hussein from the inside. I mean, we saw what happened. When the Iraqis rose up against Saddam, when when the Shia in the south and the Kurds in the north were um, suppressed and massacred ruthlessly, as as American forces sat by after the Gulf War, and then this is after George H. W. Bush had encouraged the Iraqis to rise up against the dictator, which they promptly did with the assumption that U.S. support would be forthcoming, and of course it wasn't. Um, you know, it, it it was an absolute nightmare state, and your point about the succession struggle that would have been. Um, inevitable between Uday and Kuse. Uh, it, it's just, it's yeah, all, I, I mean, think, as you said, it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen in these counterfactuals, but I think it was very likely that there would have been a violent succession struggle. 
enter entertaining the counterfactual is important. And the one thing I will say is that I, I don't want to say, oh, it certainly would have been worse had the United States not intervened, because that was something Hitchens would often say. And he would say, you know, it would have been, I think he had this line, like it would have been a Congo on the Gulf and a vortex of violence and all these, you know, Iraq ended up in a very, very dark place anyway. So with, with the U.S. intervention. And I just have no right to, I mean, it, history is just too surprising um, to, to say it would have been worse had we not intervened. And I, I think there's uh, certainly a possibility that it would have been considerably better and that the United States mm -hmm. would actually be in a much stronger position, a stronger position now um, to sort of construct this. Because it's Iraq has become this byword for all things bad, all things the right. United States, the, the, the American imperial machine, the American war machine. I mean, you'll hear people say, what right do we have to to defend the Ukrainians or give them arms um, and help them defend themselves against uh, Putin's aggression? You know, Iraq. And that's all they have to say. They just have to say the word Iraq. Well, I think see Putin people... basically makes that argument himself. Yes, he does. He does. This will be instrumentalized until the end of time. You know, I mean, when dur during the, the massacres in, in Darfur, you know, the, S the Sudanese president said, you know, you don't want to get involved here. You don't want another Iraq. I mean, another Iraq is going to haunt us for many decades. And it, just that that consequence alone could be responsible for, I mean, maybe the United States would have gotten more heavily involved in Syria if, if it didn't have the Iraq syndrome hanging over it. I don't know. I mean, but it's just that that's I'm the thing about sure, these kind of actuals. I'm not even sure Trumpism would have resonated to the degree that it did without Iraq. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, when I used to go and cover some of the rallies and I would talk to people, and that was the thing you would hear a lot. I used to be a certain type of Republican, but then Iraq happened and the party needs to be fundamentally sort of burned to the ground and restarted. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you just you hear people like Glenn Greenwald just repeat the mantra. I mean, he, is, he doesn't even have to feel the need to make arguments anymore. He can just say the word Iraq and his, the argument's over. Well, he's you know? very Nothing fixated on that. that. Yeah, he's obsessed with it. I mean, anybody, you know, if if you if you ever if David David Frum can can criticize Hitler and somebody's going to sweep in and say Iraq, you know, you you were Bush's speechwriter and you did X, Y, and Z, and have you atoned for your crimes, sir? I mean, it's just this just comes up endlessly, and I I just think I think it's actually one of the more toxic elements of our our discourse now because I think it drives this this kind of insane fetishization of contrarianism and anti-establishment thinking because as you can just look at Iraq and you can just say well this is what happens when the elites are in charge what we need is, is something like a Trump you know Trump who who lied about his I, I don't I'm not going to say that Trump was a strong supporter of the Iraq war ever but he was kind of you know he's kind of lost about it and he kind of expressed some equivocal support for it and then later on he ran against it very ferociously and I'll never forget him attacking Jeb Bush as if Jeb Bush was George H.W. Bush uh, during the Republic, and just just pinning a rock on him. Um, so yeah, the, these are all massive costs that y you just have to f put in the calculus. I wonder what, because Hitchens, as you've sort of alluded to, sort of um, was heterodox and straddled sort of interesting uh, cultural ground in one ways he could be very iconoclastic, but in other ways he was defensive of certain policies into the 2000s that would be, you know, very much against the sort of Volkswagen Beetle driving Curry 04 suburban mom type. And I wonder what he would have made of this sort of uh, Iraq being used as sort of the canonical example of sort of sticking it to the establishment, like you just said, and this sort of interesting interplay between the establishments, uh, the identification of the establishment with, um, you know, supporting these sort of interventions that he had defended. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he he would recognize the way in which it's being very cynically instrumentalized. I mean, I, I don't actually know uh, how Hitchens would have gone about it. I always have to provide these disclaimers when I talk. I, yeah, know, that's I a, no it's idea. fair. It's a fair disclaimer. We don't know. He's not around to ask him, unfortunately. Yeah, he's not around. And, you know, he, he was he was also known for being politically unpredictable in, in many ways. Yeah, so that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's definitely hard to... But yeah, and it's like when when I think there there is this kind of meme that was floating around briefly. I remember Matt Matt Iglesias said that he thought Hitchens would be a Trump supporter, and I just I just like it just it's so insanely hard for me to imagine that being the case. I mean that for one thing there was uh, Trump's foreign policy, which I, I just feel Hitchens would have despised if he changed or if he stayed on the same trajectory. And um, the idea that the United States should have just held the Iraqis at gunpoint and taken their oil is not something that would have resonated with Hitchens. 
um, or the use of Islam as just a political cudgel. I mean, it's it's not it's not as if uh, Trump stayed awake at night wondering if we were doing enough to support the Kurds and the Northern Alliance in, in Afghanistan. I mean, the, he, he just you know so. But yeah, I just I just have to kind of because it was it was uh, Trump versus Clinton. He hates the Clintons. Yeah, I wonder you know, what he would so have made of Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I mean, maybe a protest vote would have been in order that time around. Uh, maybe would have uh, written in right. later or something. I don't know. But as you did point out, I guess uh, Clinton was more supportive than President Obama of, of uh, lengthening uh, the time of intervention in Libya, for instance. I do vividly remember Hitchens saying, um, I, this was during the Democratic primary in 08. Um, he was he just said, I would vote for Clinton if she took a harder line on Iraq. I mean, he, he basically just said, like, he just wants, he 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 would sometimes say he was a single issue voter uh, around that time. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. That might have been, there might have been a bit of bravado involved there. But I do distinctly remember him saying at one point that there there was, was a circumstance in which he could find himself voting for Hillary Clinton. And I think it had to do with whether she'd be hawkish, sufficiently hawkish. Um, I'm going to read a... A uh, quote from uh, Richard Dawkins on Twitter, because I think uh, it'd be worth talking a little bit about uh, Hitchens and Islam. So uh, Richard Dawkins on July 31st says, what sounded to many ears like Islamophobia was actually Hitchens' refusal to treat Muslims as somehow less than rational. Paraphrase from Matt Johnson's book, How Hitchens Can Save the Left, Rediscovering Furious Liberalism in an Age of Counter-Enlightenment. Yeah. So can you talk uh, um... a little bit about... Uh, Hitchens' relationship with Islam and sort of um, what Richard Dawkins is alluding to there. And um, just personally, I was excited to see him, uh, obviously, who was often thought of in the same sentence as Christopher Hitchens, drawing attention to your book and obviously engaging with it. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Uh, it was definitely a tweet that, that received a lot of engagement. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like operating in, in the netherworld in Twitter, so it's it's kind of cool to, to see to see the book get some attention at that level. Um, but yeah, it, my basic argument there was that Hitchens, he, he, he treated, he took Muslims seriously. Um, he like after the Rushdie fatwa, there was a, a compendium of essays in support of Rushdie's right to speak. And it was called for Rushdie. And it, it originated, um, in, you know, the Muslim world for lack of, of a better term. Um, and Hitchens would often say that, you know, it's a tremendous insult when somebody like Jimmy Carter uh, writes an op-ed in the New York Times saying that Rushdie has gone out and recklessly offended, you know, over a billion Muslims, um, as if the extremists who are out in the streets burning the satanic verses and, uh, you know, the people who attacked embassies over the Danish cartoons uh, represent all of Islam and all Muslims. I mean, it, it's difficult to think of a more insulting position to take. And Hitchens uh, had too much respect for too many Muslims who he knew, including the Kurds, uh, who were predominantly Sunni Muslim, um, to treat them in that way and to act like they're one giant block of extremists that we have to placate. Um, so I think Dawkins was sort of channeling that that idea that you know you don't you don't have to infantilize these other human beings. <laughs> it's, it's very it's very insulting the way many defenders of Islam, quote unquote, or defenders of of Muslims um, insult them. I wonder what Hitchens would have made of sort of the in the view of myself and a lot of others uh, the rise in sort of explicit calls for uh, censorship these days. Um, obviously, in some cases, it might be around uh, religious type uh, um, iconography or discussion, but just sort of in general, and I'm, I'm getting there, I wonder if, and I know, um, for instance, Glenn Greenwald, whom you mentioned earlier, has in a way buried the hatchet on certain issues with some of his, the, his longtime critics of American foreign policy to say, be on the same side of, you know, the dangers of censorship. Yeah, um, actually, Greenwald just tweeted uh, uh, some. He said something about the introduction to Animal Farm, which was originally unpublished but was later published. Um, I think in the mid seventies, and he was basically saying that the the media was in lockstep about Ukraine, and George Orwell in that introduction was warning against the sort of soft censorship of consensus. 
Um, and if you have actually read that that introduction, which is kind of ironic that it was suppressed, um, or at least it's just not deemed fit for publication. I, I think Orwell was making a really nuanced point, and it was a point that Hitchens made often, which is the fact that um, the form of censorship we have to be most worried about in the West uh, is is self censorship. I mean, it's 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 the it's the fear of outraging our own political tribes. It's the fear of of breaking with the consensus. Um, we it's see actually that impossible. As an editor, we see this all the time, and um, it's something that we're constantly thinking about. And obviously, I'm sure for a lot of writers, they are, we obviously take a very pro sort of free speech stance, but I think a lot of writers are wondering how strong of language they can use to make a certain point for fear of kind of slaying certain sacred cows. And uh, even in the course of making a certain argument, there are certain things that they sort of hold back going sort of full throttle ahead. Yeah. And I, I think this is why Hitchens made such a huge deal out of what he saw as theocratic encroachments on free speech. Uh, he just thought that the West's response to the Rushdie fatwa and later to the Danish cartoon controversy was a really bad sign because it showed that we we didn't have the courage of our convictions. We were we were willing to buckle, um, even even from a sort of diffuse threat from, you know, what I think I think Salman Rushdie described uh, Khomeini as as uh, an aging theocrat in an antique land. You know, I mean, this this, this was enough to get us to to pull an the satanic land. verses like that from. Phrase. Yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't produce it myself. But yeah, like this was enough to get us to to pull the books from from the shelves and for us to panic and for people like Jimmy Carter to take to the the airwaves and to the pages of the New York Times to declare. Yeah, that I we, still we, can't the last believe. Thing we do is offend. Well, in a way, I can, but it is still kind of astounding to think that. Former President Carter took that position. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. You can pull up the the piece. It's it's pretty. It's I pretty, believe that uh, I've read it because at MW we had some coverage when uh, Rushdie was attacked in in New York State, and uh, in the course of that, uh, I think the writer drew attention. Gerfried Ambrosch, if you know him, uh, drew attention to uh, that op ed by President Carter and said, you know, a former American president was. Base. I don't. I don't. I think it's maybe. I don't want to say paving the way for that, but was unduly critical of Rushdie just exercising basic freedom of expression. Yeah, he said something in the op-ed, something like, um, "You know, here here in the West, we've become exclusively concerned with the author's rights." Um, I suppose there's always there's always an argument to be made for being strategic or tactical or what have you. Uh, but yeah, we're concerned with the author's rights because there's a there's a death sentence <laughs> which has been issued against him. And there are people dying in the streets over a book that many of them hadn't read because it hadn't been translated into their languages. Um, it, this was this was just the most incredible paroxysm of, of rage and stupidity. And it, yeah, I, I just think Hitchens saw responses like Carter's and responses from and, you know, Rushdie would almost or often say that many intellectuals and writers uh, supported him. I mean, I, I don't want to paint some, I don't want to paint some picture of just this massive civilizational suicide or massive uh, capitulation. But there was enough of it to, and and just seeing seeing major book selling chains like like Walden Books uh, pull the book from their shelves like that 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 is really alarming, and it's something that has stayed with us. I mean, um, I forgot sure who I first heard. I forgot who I first heard making this point, but um, it's. They said something like, you know, if somebody wanted to put on the Book of Mormon, but about Islam and it was a major Broadway production, can you imagine it getting produced? I mean, just trying to no satirize way. Islam. No way. There's no way it would happen. No way. It, it's just there is when this is what Kanan Malik says, calls internalizing the fatwa. He wrote this really brilliant book called From Fatwa to Jihad. And that that expression has always just stuck in, in my mind. We have internalized it. And I, it's it's not. You know, I, I don't like it when the Mark Steins of the world sort of present Islam as a greater civilizational threat than it, a radical Islam as a greater civilizational threat than it is. I think in some ways Hitchens's preoccupation with it was perhaps even it dates him a little bit. You know, I mean, I think we have China to worry about. We have climate change to worry about. But at the same time, the, we don't know what's coming in the future. And, and this is a test and we fail. And I think that was the point Hitchens was really trying to make ad nauseum. Um, and we failed this test over and over again. There was a book published by Yale University Press called The Cartoons That Shook the World um, about the Danish cartoon controversy. 
And it, it, they decided they just couldn't put the cartoons in the book. And this came out in 2009, you know, and this like we just have to keep relitigating this fight. And we so many of us keep ending up on the wrong side of it. And it, it's it's just alarming, you know. So Hitchens may not have been surprised, for instance, by Andrew Sullivan being ousted from New York Magazine and the whole James Bennett New York Times controversy of the summer of 2020 and the like. And he maybe saw that all that coming on the horizon. I think so. Yeah. And I, I, I remember the Bennett ouster vividly. I actually wrote about it. It's in my chapter on first. It's the chapter is called First Amendment Absolutism. It's the first chapter of the book. Um uh, that's another case where it's not that I think the New York Times getting rid of its uh, opinion page editor is is just like I'm not saying that the foundations of civilization are crumbling, uh, but it was it was pretty alarming to me because there were these concepts that were getting stretched uh, beyond recognition. I mean, there were journalists at the New York Times saying that running Tom Cotton, Senator Tom Cotton's essay, which which basically called for um, they called for the National Guard to be deployed in cities where rioting was was Send in the tearing troops. Them to the ground. Send in the troops was the title of the article. Uh, they were saying that running that article put their lives in danger. Um, that was the thing. It was it was saying running this puts um, black NY Times staffers' lives in danger. That was like the tweet that made its way around. And I just thought, you know, you could you could easily make that argument about so many positions. I mean, it, it, any any argument that you might hear from the Heritage Foundation about law enforcement and how we need, well, that's putting people's lives in danger. Got got to squelch it. Got it's just like I I just I hate the elasticity of language when it's used in that way. And uh, you know, I think that's the sort of thing that Hitchens Hitchens was good about targeting. I mean, he always that's one of the things he valued uh, so much about Orwell is that Orwell was always telling people to look at look at the way people are constructing their arguments and look at the way language can corrupt thought. And I do think that thing ideas like that, like this op-ed in the New York Times put my life in danger, um, you know, maybe in some incredibly diffuse sense. But my God, I mean, if you're going to argue like that, then you just have this huge quiver full of, of arrows that you can fire at anything to press it and, and to neutralize it. And I just I, I find it ugly. Well, I think this brings us to a good place because I want to close by talking about how Hitchens argued. We're all familiar with, for instance, Hitchens Razor and um, some of his polemical tactics and how he made arguments and uh, perhaps most most importantly, the turns of phrase he would use and some of his takedowns were just incredible. So can you talk a little bit about how Hitchens argued and maybe put that in the context of trends in how arguments are made, sort of what you were just alluding to over the past 25 years or so? Yeah, um, I mean, he was he was an interesting debater for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, he, he would just occasionally, he would occasionally find himself saying things that sounded highly colloquial. I mean, it just did, it didn't seem like the, the standard erudite <laughs> mode of communications. I mean, when he, he was, he had a, he had a debate with some, uh, some conservative radio host. And, uh, I think he, he just called in and, um, you know, the guy, the guy said something like, you know, what if God made you and what if God owns you, you know, and Hitchens is like, I don't recognize anybody's right to own me. He's like, that's, that's called slavery. And I find it disgusting, you know, and then the guy kept pressing him and just saying, yeah, but, but he owns you. And then Hitchens said, fuck you. He just, he would just like, you just drop these bombs. Fuck you. I mean, it's just like, this is what I was attracted to when I was younger. It's just like this. And the image this, on the cover of the book sort of conveys that vibe. Yeah. Doesn't it? Pugnacity. Yeah. I mean, for sure. It, it, it's definitely, you know, I mean, when, after after Falwell died, he said, "If you gave Falwell an enema, he could be buried in a matchbox." I mean, he was he was a pretty brutal uh, rhetorician when he wanted to be, um, and I I, I, th I do think that that's that's one of the reasons why you'll see him racking up the millions of views on YouTube, and that's one of the reasons why younger people will be uh, attracted to to his sort of role in in our culture as a public intellectual, um, as a sort of no holds barred public intellectual. And I just don't, you know, I do think it's. It's funny because in some senses, this argument almost seems anachronistic because it does seem like the milk toast commentators, you know, like uh, the Brooks and Shields of the world. That's, I'm not even hating on David Brooks. I, I like a lot of this stuff. But, you know, you know, like the, the people that don't exactly spot, inspire a young writer to like, you know, take up uh, 
polemic and take up debate and do all well, these things. It's also, like, and you've alluded to this sort of this figure of, of Hitchens when, you know, kind of at his deathbed and he kind of maintained his atheism when, you know, there'll be no deathbed conversions for me, just kind of that cigarette in his mouth, just sort of that, that attitude, that swagger that I think could definitely make a young writer say, I want to be like him. Even if I'm yeah. not taking all the same positions, I, that's what I imagine a, I don't give a, you know, what writer type to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of that in the memory of Hitchens. And I, I think it sometimes even distorts the picture of Hitchens because he's viewed as more of a gadfly, more of a sort of reflexive uh, contrarian figure, just, just somebody who's out to stir things up and, and like, like his take down of Mother Teresa. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is, I even even the Mother Teresa book, I think he was taking issue with um, with a, a sort of cultural dogma. You know, I mean, a, a lot of the arguments he made about Mother Teresa, it's not, it's not that you know, I'm not I'm not, not going to go get on the barricades uh, trying and, and build my career around ripping Mother Teresa or Princess Diana or any of these people. But I think he went after her because he knew that an attack on Mother Teresa would be more forceful than a generic attack on the Catholic Church because there was this cult of personality that had built up around her. That's why it's so many people will just incredulously say, why would you ever say anything negative about Mother Teresa? But it is true. She was quite rich. Especially the title. Held... Yeah, the title is just obviously. I, I think the title actually worked against him. I mean, that was one of those things that almost made him look. It's almost just clownish, you know? Uh, the title of right. the book for your uh, for your listeners is the missionary position. Um, right. But well, I can you know, see where somebody who might want to a little bit, maybe a little bit like with some of those cartoons of um, Muhammad to bring up David Brooks. I know he was saying this phrase. I am Charlie is not exactly accurate because most of us wouldn't relish the opportunity, even if we were critical of certain elements of Islam, probably wouldn't relish the opportunity to mock it in as uh, kind of offensive a way as possible. So I think with the title, maybe some people would ordinarily be more inclined to listen, could be potentially turned away by just sort of how kind of outrageous that title is uh, to a lot of people. Yeah, that actually, I went on this uh, podcast called Decoding the Gurus, where they just kind of like, they, they, they discuss these sort of secular gurus, you know, like Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein and all these people. Um, and we were talking about Hitchens's approach to to debates about religion and how we talked about islam and i i mentioned that i i do think it was probably counterproductive if you're trying to forge alliances political alliances with moderate muslims and if you're you know if you're trying to to support um the northern alliance in afghanistan or moderate influences in iran um who who might still be religious if not you know like in you know the kind of religion that was being expressed by the ayatollah or by the the theocratic authorities like I mean, it, you might turn people off you might you might actually alienate them you might make it more difficult to forge these alliances and then i just think hitchens would have that's said that's no, not my job i'm not a diplomat that's not my thing and you know so it, it, there, well, there's it's true there's something approaches. there's something the idea of different segments of society advocating for different positions or more extreme versions of positions because that's where they're arguing from so you know, to stay with the religious example, there's one thing for a priest to say, you should take this position on contraception, kind of knowing that probably most people aren't going to follow, but that's kind of the role of, of the position that he's going to articulate. Because So I could see sort of someone saying, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm a little bit of a, or a cartoonist, I'm a little bit of a provocateur. It's not uh, my job to teach, uh, to, as you said, be a diplomat or to teach an etiquette class. So I, I could see where there's some weight to that. But uh, obviously, on the other hand, um, it seems as though one's trying to kind of stick a, a burning hot rod on the uh, on the on the side of someone who maybe uh, would otherwise be receptive to listening. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I, I am also sure that like the new atheist approach has probably appealed to a lot of people. It might have been the the push that a lot of people needed. I mean, I've I have heard a lot of accounts of of people in closed societies and and theocratic societies being drawn to the new atheists because they were transgressive because they were so pugnacious. So I just think that when you try to sort of tally up influence and you try to try to determine what's actually having the biggest effect in the world, it's really hard to make that calculation. It's just conceivable to me that taking the line Hitchens did could could have been politically counterproductive. And just to, to close one point about um, Hitchens' style. You know, I, I said I said earlier that um, he his rhetoric has kind of taken over. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's sort of become 
like today with the sub stackification of, of the internet and with a lot of people kind of constructing their, their own um, audiences. And I don't want to say echo chambers because I mean, in many ways, sub stack is a good way to find new ideas. Well, and, that is a and great to have... word. Sub stack, sub stackification. I'm going to yeah. write that <laughs> one down. Yeah, well, I, I just, I do think that it, there's, there's this point that I heard Sam Harris make uh, in an interview recently where he said something like the the selective pressures on ideas are disappearing. Like we, we no longer have a survival of the fittest sort of media ecosystem is because they're mm -hmm. so, it's so incredibly um, like stratified now. And you, you just, there's an audience for anybody. And what I was going to say is that the way in which my sort of, um, my reverence for Hitchens's irreverence uh, is is kind of anachronistic today. Is the fact that you just look at somebody like Candace Owens, or you look at like Matt Walsh, or you look at a lot of really well known uh, polemicists or podcasters. Well, on today. Twitter, they're they're a dime a dozen. A friend of mine is on top like... of following the Twitter sphere, and he rattles off these names at the tip of his tongue. And I don't know some of these names, but they're everywhere, and they're pugnacious they are caustic exactly. and they are not are taking no prisoners one after another there's a exactly. whole you throw a dart and you can hit one <laughs> yeah well that's that's the problem is because the like i you know you do have plenty of that now it's not it's not the dreary procession of establishment journalists it's it's like the contrarian um you know kind of like radical anti-establishment heterodox sphere like that that that's now just like in a way so i guess now everyone's like hitchens or maybe a, a, a facts a effort to be his facsimile even if they can't quite you know spin the yeah, so, as well well and that's and that's the distinction i would make i just like that's why i wrote the book i actually think hitchens had these coherent principles i mean i i really do think that it all comes down to this sort of suitcase term universalism it, it fed into his internationalism it fed into his disdain for identity politics um it, it's this basic assumption that every life has equivalent value and we have to i mean there is something almost utilitarian about it hitchens was not a utilitarian i'm not saying he was but it, it's just that it's just this like overall idea that that we should be constructing a global civil society to the extent possible and and I the way he argued for that position, which he was becoming more explicit about in his last twenty years, especially his last ten years, um, I I found compelling. I really want to I really want to restore, um, or at least draw people's attention to just how coherent some of those ideas were. And this this is what I don't think you get from Candace Owens. It's not what you get from a lot of these people who are carving out their their niches on the Trumpist right or on the sort of anti imperialist you know, Glenn Greenwaldian left. I mean, I just think the quality of of their arguments and and the quality of their prose as well is severely lacking. I mean, I do think Hitchens was was a one off in in all of these areas. He actually had the principles. He kind of had the receipts. Like he's he's not a he's not just somebody who's in it for you know attention and and clicks at all costs. Um, so I you know I do think he's still relevant in that sense. And it seems though, as you're saying, he's kind of maybe a canonical small L liberal in extent insofar small L liberal is associated with um, a universal identity, a universal community of human beings kind of across borders. But in many respects now is sort of the age of particularism. Both parties have sort of rediscovered protectionism. Joe Biden is kind of borrowing Donald Trump's uh, economic mantra with, you know, buy American, hire American, in a way, this yeah, is yeah. on both the left and the right. This is the age of particulars, and the left says, "Let's get in our little platoons, our little tribes." You're a black person, you're a Asian person, and then you know uh, maybe on the other side, you know we're you know Americans have been here for more than 200 years or something like that. And it seems, in many respects, that on both the left and the right, there is sort of this age of the particular, whereas these these guys are, and I guess you could say, a lot of people would say that a lot of voices in the Republican party also used to be sort of the voices of the universal, but after Iraq, to get back to Iraq, that Iraq in many, at least in my view, Iraq was sort of the defining moment that caused both parties, first the Republicans, and then maybe later the Democrats, especially driven by some of those voices that were very critical of Libya, said Libya is another Iraq, to sort of rediscover particularism, for better or for worse. So people like particularism. Yeah, no, no, I, the way the way you put it there is is perfect. Like really, it's, this is the core point that I want people to extract from the book. It's it's just the idea that the to the extent that the right used to be 
um reaganite for lack of a better term this is it i do feel like that term kind of gets thrown around loosely these days i hear will salatan just say reaganite as if it's just kind of an, un an unalloyed good nowadays um and i i, I kind of have to cringe a little bit i know hitchens would have cringed because he wasn't the biggest reagan fan in the world um but you know this this idea that the united states has a role in the world and it's an important role and that we should we should um seek to build the the structures and the norms necessary to maintain something akin to a rules-based global order. I know these are these are all ab ab boogeyman terms now. I mean, this is this is just this is the kind of talk that makes people think, oh, well, you know, the time of the Davos set and the post uh, Cold War triumphalism and Fukuyamianism and all that. It's it's all over. You know, it's now we're getting back to basics. We're getting back to nationalism. And then yeah, the left is responding to that with its own form of insular politics. It's responding to that with identity politics. And you'll, you'll hear Bernie Sanders. I mean, the guy just sounds like, he, he sounds like Pat Buchanan sometimes. And that, and by the way, I, I respect uh, Sanders a lot more than I respect Pat Buchanan. But when it comes to like, when it comes to uh, the economy, I mean, he'll just say, yeah, buy American, build things here. You know, the idea of, of, of trying to guide globalization with trade agreements like the TPP, which Sanders ferociously resisted and which, Clinton actually came out against, despite the fact that it was one of Obama's signature achievements and which was shredded by Trump. Um, and then so then you just see that territory, um, you know, then you just don't have um, nearly as much influence over what's happening in that part of the world and influence over China. And it, this is this seems small minded to me. It seems like a, a reversion and it, it's regressive. Um, you know, it, it's just it's just depressing. And uh, I mentioned Pat Buchanan, the, the, the America first attitude uh, which America First was uh, obviously has a sordid history in the United States. It was Lindbergh's America First committee that wanted to keep us out of World War II, which was more than tinged with anti-Semitism. And then Pat Buchanan's America Firstism regarded NAFTA as some horrendous totalitarian imposition and thought the United States should retreat to Fortress America. And, you know, th this is an ugly history and the, the right is embracing it so wholeheartedly. And I, I just think it's a terrible regression um, on both sides. Mainly on the right. Last question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but a lot of people who are going to be listening to this already know a decent amount about Christ Christopher Hitchens. What is a point that when they read this book, they're going to learn something about Christopher Hitchens that they don't know about and they're going to be surprised about? What's something in there they can look forward to? Mm -hmm. Trying to think of something, something that's uh, particularly good. You know, I would say just to, because I'd, I'd like to say, well, first of all, just one fun thing and then one slightly more substantial thing. Um, apparently, uh, R Ralph Nader uh, once off offered Hitchens a largish sum of money to stop smoking, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but some of your listeners nice. might know that, but yeah, pretty cool. Nice. Um, the more substantial it's thing is- It's good to is, be concerned about our friend's health. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, but it's just the, the fact that they were like buddies and I can just like picture that interaction. It's just, there's something hilarious about it. Um, but I, I think it's, it's Hitchens's Europeanism in some ways, uh, is, is something that might surprise people. Um, there was, a there was this like fact sheet published, um, by the European commission about, um, how somebody, uh, a certain Christopher Hitchens was, was attacking the EU and saying that it's, uh, some of its legal provisions were like a, an unacceptable intrusion on the, um, the laws and customs of his home country. And this was published in 2014. Mm -hmm. And Peter Hitchens mm -hmm. had to publish a, a correction and say, oh, you're talking about my late brother, Christopher, but that, that was actually me who wrote that. You got, you got the Hitchenses turned around. And then Peter said, you know, uh, my brother was actually much more supportive of the European project than, than you might, uh, than many of his supporters might know. And I think uh, Peter Hitchens is probably right about that because Hitchens Hitchens didn't write that much about the EU, but he and he actually did write an article for Foreign Policy magazine about how he thought the Eurozone was probably doomed, which is very pessimistic for somebody who's a supporter of that project. But I do think he saw it as a truly radical um, political endeavor. Um, you know, Orwell even called for a United Socialist States of, of, of Europe. And, and this is an old left wing idea. And there were actually a lot of Left wingers in, in the seventies and eighties who who supported Europeanism and European integration, and I think Hitchens was was uh, coming around to the view um, throughout the second half of his career that, that this is actually a, a sort of radical achievement, the, the idea of a borderless federal Europe. And he he has a debate with his brother 
I think it's over uh, the abolition of Britain, which is uh, Peter Hitchens' book. It was published in like the early 2000s. And you can really see uh, how just how fervently Hitchens, is, uh, su Hitchens supported the European project. So I think that's that's something that people might find interesting because, you know, we just went through Brexit. People are talking about um, just the sustainability of the European project in general. And I think the idea that that project is radical and could could even be considered left wing might come as a shock. Um, and I, I tried to sort of explain why it is, in fact, a radical project and, and a successful one in many ways. Um, so, yeah, that's that's one thing. It's a, probably much more long winded than, than you were you were hoping for when you asked. But there you go. No, that's um, that's great, Matt. You know, you're the author. So we want to we definitely want to hear from you. But once again, everyone, Matt Johnson and the book is. How Hitchens Can Save the Left. Matt, thanks so much for talking with me. Thanks for having me, man. It was very fun. 